So Marine Land Animal Defense, uh, to tell that story uh, from my own personal experience, I'd have to go back to about 2008. Um, I had a friend uh, whose sister was a trainer at Marine Land, and um, I just recently got involved in kind of animal rights and animal liberation type stuff, and I was offered the ability to go and see basically behind the scenes, to see the cages and where the sea lions are kept. Um, and it's funny because with a lot of things um, in our kind of consumer society, we don't really think about what actually goes on. A lot of people are still under the impression that there's like this uh, wintry like hibernation palace for uh, orca whales or there's a graveyard specifically for orca whales or dolphins. They're stuck there the entire year, whether that's on season or off season. And if you actually see the pens that they live in, they're extremely small for a lot of animals that are, you know, free ranging animals and wild animals as well. So I saw the situation firsthand and uh, obviously it really touched me. And I was also at that time really aware of the fact that people had demonstrated at this park in the Niagara region for over 20 years at this point. So by the time Greenland Animal Defense comes in, or even I come to this story, there's a long history of opposition and resistance to this park. So one of the things I want to talk about tonight, when you're talking about organizing, you really have to survey the landscape. So I start organizing in the animal liberation community in Niagara, 2008 and 2009, and I'm armed with this knowledge that there's this park that people really hate and that people have demonstrated there for a very long time. So what you're looking at is in a specific community in my region, that is really the most hated place. You know, if I'm going to pick a target, you generally want to go after a place that and I don't want to use the language target in a gun shoot or anything like that sense, but in the other sense of it's just a, a place where we focus our attention. Um, but if I'm going to pick a place, you know, you want to pick a place that a lot of people already have kind of a lot of resentment towards, or you need to basically build that up to that spot. So in a lot of ways, uh, people coming to this issue who were younger like myself got lucky because already there was so much work that had been done there. So 2009, I start to organize with a group there who had been uh, dem doing demonstrations previously, and this is a group called Niagara Action for Animals. And we did about three to four demonstrations a year from 2009 to 2010. And they were really symbolic kind of demonstrations. It was really tame sign holding. Um, you know, we didn't really feel like we were getting much of a response from people going into the park or even from the park owner, John Holler. Um, but we did have a presence and we were kind of mobilizing in some numbers. By the time 2011 comes along, I had already had an idea to work with some people to develop an actual sustained campaign. So basically, when you're talking about effective organizing, a lot of that is just moving the things that you're doing that are very symbolic. So anything that you would do an event once a year, plan, plan an actual sustained campaign around it. Don't do just one action and then let things drop off and then do it again and get press again the next year whatever you're working on, try and think of things in the terms of we're going to sustain this pressure across this amount of time to reach this goal, right? So we develop a name, Rainland Animal Defense. Matt is the acronym. Um, I had my buddy out on the West Coast, Matt uh, Gack, made the logo. Uh, we had a banner. We got some leaflets printed up, and we basically decided that we're going to up the demonstration schedule from about 13, or sorry, three demonstrations a year to about 13. And uh, this is something that we see as um, what I call now an incremental intersectional grassroots campaign. So or I shouldn't say intersectional grassroots pressure campaign. Intersectional just meaning that it's a coalition base. Grassroots meaning that it's organized horizontally. We just have all volunteers. And then pressure campaign and that as time moves on, the pressure just continues to build against this park so that our goals and basically the alternatives we're putting forward are just looking more and more viable throughout so we set this up and it's just a bunch of young kids. Like if I'm going to honestly tell the story of Marineland Animal Defense, there was a lot of people who had organized in that park for a long time previously. Those people had went through a slap suit in 2004 to 2006. That was eventually dropped at the discovery stage, which uh, I should say slap suit. It's a strategic lawsuit against public participation. Uh, it's really wordy. It just basically means corporations that have a lot of resources and can use their influence within the legal system to try and silence you, right? I don't have $1.5 million. There will not be enough vegan bake sales in the world to raise $1.5 million, right? Um, and in the end, they don't really want to win that amount. But within the process of that, they want 
myself and others to take all the resources that we're putting into this campaign and then move them and focus just on the lawsuit. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. There we go. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. But um, so basically we had a, what it's called a, basically a, a generational gap kept happening at Marineland and we, we could see this basically as a cycle. There would be people who would come in, do a lot of organizing for a couple of years. There would either be burnout or there would be blowback from the park when they became successful. And then people would basically walk away and be like, whoa, I, I can't take any more of this and we're not seeing enough results. So in a lot of ways, Marineland Animal Defense works in the beginning because we had a lot of people involved who were just too young to know. Um, we had people who were older who were telling us like, no, there's no real point. There was a lot of organizations who had put in a lot of time and resources before this point and had really gotten to a certain point and they just felt like there was nothing else that could be done. John Holler is one of the most influential and richest businessmen in the Niagara Falls area and he does a lot for the tourist economy. So um, the political level is basically there's no room for you there, right? And uh, we got a lot of this and we were just like, who cares? Like, let's just, we're going to demonstrate. Like, we love demonstrating. This is awesome. Woo! Woo! That? <laughs> so we set up in uh, 2011. And throughout that whole span of the first year, we were able to basically take the things that were happening to us and spin them back to build. So what immediately happens is we immediately are met with a, a very intense police presence. We were just tamely holding signs on the side of the road. And then we would have people in safety vests uh, basically reaching out to leaflet parks or cars as they came into the park. By the time we got to our second demonstration there, we had about, uh, it was about 60 people. And at its height, there were seven cop cars came out. The last one coming was a court services van. And all of the cops had put their gloves on as if they were going to make mass arrests. And basically swept through the crowd from one end to the other, standing over top of females, breathing on top of them, walking into male demonstrators and hitting them standing in front of male demonstrators so they can't film what's going on or other people who are filming. Uh, a bunch of cops who came out that day didn't actually have their badge numbers on, refused to give them. Wow. So the beauty of knowing a bit about the history of what had gone on there, we obviously weren't expecting a response like that, but we did know that you know the police do play a role in protecting this business. So what do you do in response to that? You film, you film everything. Mm -hmm. Everyone that day, we probably had about five different people filming. Um, through that process, we were able to take all that footage, spin it back publicly and say like, look, this is absurd, right? Instead of the cops being able to come in and intimidate people and have people think, whoa, like I can't be here. You know, like, this isn't a place where I can bring kids or like I'm gonna get arrested, people being scared. We managed to turn that into something very powerful, put it back out on social media. It helped expand our reach and our demonstrations actually grew from that right off the bat. The rest of the year, we still had to deal with cops, but we went through the OPRID process, which is basically the police review process. For anyone who's ever campaigning, I suggest to do it at least once. Um, it's cops basically reviewing the behavior of other cops, um, which will never turn out in your favor, um, but at least <laughs> illustrates to them that you know the process, right? So they come, they try to strong arm us, we use it in social media to build our reach, we file the OPRID complaint to them and illustrate back to them, like, look, we actually know our rights. We know we're well within our rights. We know what you're attempting to do in this process, and it's not going to work. So they come out in their presence for the rest of the year, but we've never had to deal with cops in the same way. A uh, funny story that I'll tell about the OPRID complaint. Um, there was no actually notes made by the cops that day. Um, but because they basically are forcing that process to give their testimony on what happened, um, all of the cops who were involved had a copy and paste statement about how um, Dylan Powell was unlawful and kept grabbing and stroking his genitals and staring at police officers. Yeah. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And obviously if I was doing that, they would have made note of this, right? But... Um, that was them basically, you know, showing their hand and sending like a kind of not so polite fuck you back to us, right? Like they understood we knew the process and so now we were kind of on a, a level playing field, right? <laughs> Don't start doing that. Now. I've never <laughs> done that. I've never done that. <laughs> it must have been me they saw, I guess. What's that? It must have been me they saw. I was. <laughs> 
So 2011 basically continues on, and because the cops aren't playing that role that John Holler basically wants them to play. So John Holler is the park owner and founder and president. Um, back in 1961, he founds this park. Uh, he's been running it ever since. He privately owns the park, so he basically makes all the decisions that are happening at the park. As far as like going to someone who's a huge stakeholder in this issue, it's John Holler. But the cops basically aren't responding the way that he wants, which is basically John wants everyone arrested. You know, if you demonstrate against Greenland, you're an idiot in his mind, and you're going to get arrested. Um, so that's not happening. So he starts to he starts to escalate. And he starts getting more angry. And he starts putting up this sign that says, um, "Protesters ahead! Um, please do not stop." And originally he puts it on the side of the road, and then the bylaw officers make them move it back to the other side of the road, and then back behind the tree line, which is his property. Petty things like this may seem like you know. Pointless, but these are all kind of power struggles, and in every single instance, you have to illustrate back to these to the city of Niagara Falls and to John that look, we know the law, like we know the bylaws. So we fight this consistently, and um, what happens is John takes the sign, builds a bracket, and then drills it into a hydro telephone pole. <laughs> Which, like, again, if you know anything about hydro telephone poles, that's actually uh, hydro one property, and that's destruction of public property. You can actually weaken a pole to the point of it, you know, collapsing um, by doing something like that. So in this instance, it created a really great dynamic because every time he would put this sign up, it was already there illegally. And if the bylaw officers or the cops didn't want to do something about it, it wasn't really destruction of property if we started to mess with the sign. So we started to do some artwork, um, various <laughs> demonstrations, and then after a while, um, we also start trying to take the sign down. So basically, you know, we would show up. Uh, one demonstration, I was lucky enough to have like the right size wrench in my car. It was like the only wrench I had. Uh, so my friend and I, Eric, we, we would come to demonstrations early, leaflet. Um, but this time the sign was already up. So we go over there and I'm holding Eric up because the sign's a little bit up in the air, right? And Eric's kind of twisting away, twisting away. And all of a sudden, John Holler comes behind with his truck. And he tries to pin us between his truck and the telephone pole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, hit a, he hit a demonstrator in 1996 at a demonstration, too. And this is something he uses his vehicle in a threatening way numerous times. So this actually happens. And in the span of about a half hour in between the cops coming, uh, I put Eric down. And uh, this is like a... Another thing, if you're going to film, make sure your batteries are, like, charged <laughs> and, like, you know, your memory card is empty. So this is a really tough situation. I let Eric down, and Eric thinks the whole time that the camera I'm pointing is recording, but the memory is actually full. But I can't tell that to Eric because then John Holler also knows that we don't actually, we're not filming, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's a really dangerous situation for someone who already feels like they're above the law. So... <laughs> <laughs> Eric's in front of the car, hit me, hit me, hit me. And uh, my stomach's just in knots because I'm like trying to non verbally like tell him, like, this is not filming. <laughs> my eyes. Like... <laughs> Eventually, what ends up happening is uh, a park employee, his name was Alex, he actually came to all our demonstrations at the end of the year. He quit. He was like, so stoked. I hate this place. But he runs over to John's truck and he's basically in tears. Like, John, stop, stop. Because he seriously thought that John was going to enter us with his truck that day. Finally, John backs off. The cops come. Eric's like, we got it on film. We got it on film. <laughs> Eric, we got nothing. He's like, oh, no. <laughs> um, but the tire tracks led right up to the telephone pole. And obviously, they knew what we were doing, right? So that continues on. And we basically go through. In 2011, we basically called it Sign Gate. Like, put a hashtag on it. Effective Activism 101. You don't need to know anything else. Just come up with clever hashtags. <laughs> be sarcastic. And film people. I can now leave, but um, <laughs> sign gate is basically, you know, what we called it, and we went through this process constantly at every demonstration. Um, finally, what ends up happening, um, near the end of the, of the year, uh, we have two incidences. The first instance, we show up to a demonstration, and there's already, like, five cop cars, um, two bylaw officers, and a Niagara Falls city official, like, 9.30 in the morning, and the sign's already up. And it became like this four-hour like war of attrition and negotiation of when is the sign going to come down. Um, that was near the height of like sign gate. And um, at that point, it became very clear to us that basically what was going to happen was the city of Niagara Falls and John Holder and the Niagara Regional Police were going to work out some kind of plan to try and get rid of us. That's when that really kind of starts. Um, 
The next demonstration after that, uh, I show up early again, and uh, you can see the whole the whole video online. It's on Vimeo. It's like holder threat video. It's the is what it's called. And John's getting ready to set up to basically put the sign up. So there's people in the work truck. Look at another image. There we go. There's people in the work truck um, at this time, and they're trying to back in. And John basically gets out and filming, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, come over here. You got to back in through here." There's like trees around, so there's only like one way that it can basically get in. And I didn't think like, hey, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm gonna try and mess with this. I was just trying to film the process. And John's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, I'm gonna go stand there. <laughs> so I go and stand where they need to basically back the truck in to put the sign up. And this, like, it just infuriates John uh, to the point where on film, he says he's gonna cut my head off and he's gonna run me over. And he repeated that threat twice. So yeah, sign gate got a little intense near the end of uh, 2011. That threat, uh, we publicized it, and the Niagara Regional Police basically continue on with these private meetings with John Holder, saying like, "Look, you can't, you know, speak to people this way. If, if Dylan ever said he was going to cut your head off, then you know, he'd be in jail. So <laughs> um, you should probably stop that." Why is he in jail? Because he's a millionaire. I like it. This is funny. I just gave a talk in Kitchener Waterloo, and there was someone in the crowd who was just like adamant about this fact. Like, why is John Holman not in jail? And like, I had no other, like, nothing else to offer up other than the fact that, like, you know, he's a multimillionaire. Like, I, I, I don't know. Um, so, what ends up happening, uh, the last couple demonstrations of 2011 season, there's a really hands off approach by John and by his staff, which, like, he's got another supervisor named Carmen. Uh, who we call fingers because he has uh, he had his fingers bandaged at one point in 2011 and he kept coming to the demonstrations and like trying to fight like younger demonstrators like including me there would be like this hilarious process that would be repeated after every demonstration where I'd have to like walk this like it's probably like five miles from where we used to hand out leaflets to down to where we park so he would like fall along in his truck you ready to fight you ready to go you ready to go this time? You're like 65. Come on. <laughs> and one of these times, uh, Eric, who took the sign down, was like, ah, whatever, fingers. And he like slammed on his brakes. And it was just like, you know, the bully in like grade school. It's like he come up with some name that doesn't even mean anything. <laughs> it's just like livid, like losing his name. What do you call me? I'm kill you. <laughs> so we noticed that fingers and John, the, in the end of 2011, like they're nowhere to be found, which is super odd because they basically make these demonstrations. It's like a cat and mouse thing that they almost love. We come back and we start the season in 2012, and um, basically what ha <clears throat> what happens there is um, throughout the process of us setting our opening day demonstration, there's a whole bunch of water problems going on in the park. And um, if people have been reading the Toronto Star who came here, in the end, um, 15 whistleblowers have come forward, ex-employees, and a lot of that stems from the water problems that we're having over the winter, basically of 2011 and 2012 in the spring. So they moved their, their opening date like a week before they were supposed to open because they, they had to dump all the water in the park. And um, one of their um, trainers quit at that time. So anyways, we had about 100 people. The park wasn't open, so we, we figured we'd kind of raise a sink in uh, Niagara Falls. So we, we marched uh, probably like, I don't know, eight kilometers down to the Niagara Falls viewing area, which is Niagara Park's property and which um, is actually provincially regulated and you need to go through a permit process to hand out leaflets or carry signs or anything there. Um, sometimes it's good to use a kind of legal system or at least know the legal system to the point of, you know, those provincial laws are in place, but there's also a little thing called the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So these municipalities are not really all that interested in getting into legal battles over the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So we basically got booted off that property with about 15 to 20 bike cops kind of kettling us off that day. Um, but they, it was funny because they showed up and continued to issue this threat oh, we're going to charge you for being on this property. And it's like, there's a charter rights and freedom. So I'm like, please leave, Dylan. <laughs> please leave. <laughs> so basically we march back, and then a couple months go by, and we understand again, like, John's nowhere to be found. Fingers is nowhere to be found. So we're wondering what's really kind of going on. And then uh, in June, we get notice about five days before a city council meeting that what has happened is the Niagara Regional Police, uh, the Niagara Falls City Council, and um, city clerk, Bylaw officers and John have been meeting in the land where we used to demonstrate on, which was near the drive-in entrance to Marine Land, where we would leaflet to people, and that's where we would hold our signs. 
the land where we actually demonstrated on, the Niagara Falls City Council declared it a surplus, meaning that the public never uses it, um, which is ridiculous because they were just threatening to charge us like four months prior for using it, but meaning the public never uses it, and then they leased it to marine land basically in perpetuity. So the attempt there was to criminalize our demonstrations. They were naive enough to think that like, hey, if we just like lease this land and they can't demonstrate there without being charged with trespass, then they'll just go away. Yep. Uh, you, was there a line that you're citing in the charter when you talked about being on the provincial property? Yeah, freedom of speech, freedom of peaceful assembly. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's a municipal property, even if it's a Niagara Parks property. So um, if, if any you're in a situation like that where it's, you know, cities will have and municipalities will have certain bylaws that will be restrictive um, that they will attempt to threaten you with or attempt to enforce. Um, if you know the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and you know that that has, you know, more jurisdiction and more power and legal weight than those bylaws, you can basically call their bluff. Um, effective activism 101 is like calling bluffs. Constantly. Like call a million bluffs. <laughs> so they set up and they, they leased this land, so it was important for us in terms of escalation to come back with something substantive. So what we do is we actually move our next demonstration away from the park and to John Muller's house which home demonstrations, they have a long history in the animal liberation movement. Um, they're still considered somewhat controversial, but in southern Ontario, everyone was just like, whoa, 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 you've gone too far now at this point. Um, the fact that John is a multimillionaire, that you know thousands of animals have died in his care on site for the last 50 years, and then uh, this picture right here is actually a great lead-in. He evicted 47 families from a trailer park that he had bought up uh, 2006. Uh, 2009, he served them eviction notices after telling them for years that they were fine in the park. These were all low and fixed income families, and a lot of them had trailers that couldn't actually be moved off site. So people had invested all this money into their trailers, thinking, you know, I'm going to live here, or I've already lived here for decades, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. Um, they were served those eviction notices, and those families fought, which is Brian here and Connie, they were residents. And the lady hugging me there is Teresa. I'll get a little bit more into her story later, but go homeless.ca. You can find out more information of that. So what we did is we reached out. We've organized in solidarity with the, the park they were at. It's called Green Oaks Trailer Park. We've organized in solidarity with them since 2011 because even when we began organizing, we realized, like, viewing the landscape, this is a coalition space, and we need to have a broader critique of power and domination in the way that this man uses his power and his wealth and his business influence, you know, to treat the environment, to treat other, other human beings in this community and to treat animals, right? So we set up and we managed to do the home demonstration and through it we kind of drag people kicking and screaming and at the end people kind of realize when we go up and we set up a bake sale, a vegan bake sale on John Holler's front lawn and we basically play soccer and throw a frisbee around, that, you know, it's not really the image that they had in their mind that, you know, we're going to go there with pitchforks and kind of burn his house down with him inside. Um, we keep building after that. We understand that, um, you know, we've gone to John's house now and we've illustrated the fact that if they take more space away from us, we'll basically just continue to move to different kind of locations. Um, but we're somewhat, you know, we had to at that point really revisit all of our tactics and our strategy because... We had thought, you know, if we fly under the radar, which is a very, like, basic, you know, you're young, you're naive. You think if you fly under the radar and you do, like, very legal above ground stuff and, um, you know, you're very transparent about your organizing that, you know, you'll just make it out. You know, you, what is, what are, what is anyone going to do, right? Um, and obviously that's what we were doing and they criminalized where we were demonstrating. So for the first time in, like, you know, decades at Marine Land, uh, we went out and bought a megaphone. Charlie was like, oh my god, a megaphone, blah, blah. It's like now, it just seems ridiculous, because everyone's got like five megaphones. Um, we go and we get a megaphone, and we actually set up across from where people walk into the park. So it was way easier for them to ignore us when we were where we were previously, right? Mm -hmm. We're just tamely holding signs, we're leafleting the cars, there was no bullhorn, no yelling, no chanting, nothing. So we moved from where we were, where it was criminalized, to across the sight line of the gates, and now you cannot ignore us. There's no possible way. If you're at that park on a day when we're holding a demonstration, you know exactly what is happening. Um, there is no way to ignore basically all the information that I'm, that I'm basically telling you today. 
So effective organizing one on one, understand escalation. You know, if you guys have an opposition figure or you guys are organizing a campaign, if they come back and they try to basically undercut you and take you out, what are the spaces or the kind of tactics that you're going to move forward with? And another really, really important thing for us in learning the history of this campaign is that you can't just radicalize overnight. Um, I would really like to, in every instance, um, but it, it has to be a process and you basically have to illustrate to people how these things work. In the same way that we had to illustrate to a lot of people who you know, really love dolphins and orcas that like home demonstrations are an okay thing to do. You know, um, especially when they're against multimillionaires who evict 47 families from their home, ending in the suicide of Paul Millard, which was uh, Teresa's uh, aunt. That's why she was hugging me at the demonstration that day. As far as like uh, organize mo or moments in my organizing kind of history and things that are most powerful, this will mean like uh, this means everything to me. Like the fact that you know uh, my background growing up and the legal problems that I, my family went through and uh, how the legal system was used against them to have someone else uh, come up on that day and you know give me a hug and, and uh, cry and, and talk about how everything that's happened at the park and how we've made John a focus. Um, has affected them is like, you know, even if they win $1.5 million and I'm bankrupt, I really don't care because I got this hug, like, <laughs> realistically. <coughs> that is uh, John Holmes' house in the background. And that <laughs> is a uh, vegan bake sell from us. Um, Did he buy it? <laughs> <laughs> if John Holmes wants to buy a cupcake, it's like $1.5 million. <laughs> Are you on his property? <laughs> So, yeah, a good thing like, uh, to know is uh, residential areas and residential properties are actually buffered by like, uh, you know, like 5 to 10 feet of municipal right. property. So he's got a sidewalk that runs along in front of his house. We're basically on the sidewalk and then the front side of that. Yeah. Um, while this is all happening, we're hearing uh, basically noise on the kind of, you know, the background end that uh, some trainers have left and that some people who we knew previously who had some issues are now willing to kind of come forward. And um, this basically all leads into what happens in August, which is who read the Toronto Star articles in the room? Hands way up, way up, be proud, yeah. <laughs> so if anyone wants to see all of them, you can see them at the star.com forward slash marineland. But basically what happens in the beginning is eight ex-employees come forward. They detail testimony of systemic, uh, testimony of systemic abuse and neglect. And they're basically all corroborating each other's stories, but building on them. Some people are talking about the water system. Some people are talking about how that affected, you know, certain animals on site. Other people are talking about the land animals. Um, they paint a picture, basically, of the, what we've been saying for a very long time, which is this is one of the worst captive animal parks, you know, basically that exists. And um, that the profit motive is the only thing that John Mullen cares about. This happens, and it just so happened that we had a demonstration plan for, like, the next Saturday. The story came out on Wednesday. We had a demonstration plan for Saturday. And uh, that first demonstration that weekend, we had about 500 people come out, which is a record for Marine Land. In 1996, there was a conference. It was called the Gadfly Conference. Um, and basically, people flew in from all over the world, and they had a demo there. And that was 300 people. So we broke that record uh, with that demonstration. And um, for anyone who's been involved in organizing or, you know, tried to run campaigns like this or sustain things like public outrage and everything else is amazing. Like, it's just great. Um, but you basically stop sleeping <laughs> and uh, your life has changed forever. And you have to come up with a way to successfully kind of channel that outrage into some kind of sustained uh, momentum or sustained kind of presence. Because the way that our news media works is that they're bouncing basically from outrage to outrage to outrage to outrage in a way to sell papers. So how are you going to effectively manage to continue to get people onto the issue? Um, right off the bat, uh, what we do at that, that demonstration is we announce our closing day demonstration as our next large demonstration. That's what we're organizing towards from August 15th basically until October 7th. And we announce at that first demonstration we have Rick O'Berry coming up. Um, everyone know who Rick O'Berry is? Who wants to say who Rick O'Berry is? The star of the Pope. Oh, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, he trained with her for the television series in the 70s or something. Yeah. And yeah. then um, when the dolphin played Flipper died in the lawn, he had a complete change of life and decided to dedicate his life to 
Exactly. Uh, the best thing about Rick O'Berry is that that timeline um, basically flipper dies in his arms, which dolphins are self breathers. Um, they consciously make the decision to breathe, and he believes that it was basically a suicide that the dolphin decided to no longer breathe. Um, and he saw this as you know a resistance to captivity. Within 24 hours, he's breaking into captive animal facilities and trying to cut fences so that dolphins will get released. <laughs> so it's just like the most badass story of all time, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> I just went from like messing with dolphins and being like the worst dolphin trainer ever to like overnight, okay, I'm done. This industry needs to die. And he's been doing that uh, for about 40 years now. So we announced that demonstration, effective activism. You know, if you're doing sustained campaigning, always set a goal in the future that people can kind of look towards. Hold smaller events in between those things. Do smaller actions. Do your outreach. Do your speaking events. Um, you know, do your social media, but always have something that people can kind of channel and focus their energy towards. So we hold more demonstrations leading into basically October 7th. We have another demonstration that's 300 people. We go back, do a home demonstration uh, at John's. That's another that's 100 people. Uh, we have another demonstration that leads into the 7th. And basically October 7th comes up and we have about 800 people um, out front of the park, which um, somewhat of an animal liberation historian. Uh, it's the second largest animal advocacy demonstration in Canadian history. The first that I know of uh, would be the Festival for Animals, which happened in 19, 1984, before I was even born. So, I just blew your minds. <laughs> <laughs> so we got 800 people basically at the park, and it's really funny because in all of the things that come out in my statement of claim and basically the press that Marineland uh, wanted to do, they're basically trying to paint it as this disorganized mess of the day. But of all the demonstrations we had, we had a strict speakers list and we had a strict performers list and everything was basically spelled out top to bottom and everyone was like very on point with what was going to go on. And there was a lot of people at the demonstration who were just like not really into that because they were used to a lot of the other demonstrations where it's like five hours of chanting at people <laughs> until you lose your voice. Which I don't really have a voice right now. I should have thought about it yesterday, but I didn't. Um, but what ends up happening is there's this kind of amazing kind of carnival atmosphere that happens where, you know, people are still speaking, but it's, it's it, people are breaking that dynamic where it's like a formal kind of organized atmosphere, and it's this constant kind of struggle. And what ends up actually happening, who has seen the video of people entering the park? The game come out one? Uh, well, that was like when we come out, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So basically what ends up happening, there are 800 people outside and throughout the demonstration, people are moving farther and farther and farther and farther towards the gates of the park. And finally, it gets to a point where a couple hundred people are actually inside the gates, and then they realize that they can just jump the turnstiles. And those people then head over to the Dolphin Auditorium and shut down the Dolphin Show. I'm going to play the video if I can, if I get internet access, because there's not a lot of people, it seems, who have uh, who've seen that. And it's, it was really kind of incredible. But what happens is I'm setting up the PA system for the Call of the Wild, which was like this super like emotional kind of like, you know, if you really love dolphins, you probably really love this song. But I don't really like it because it's kind of sappy and I'm, I'm a punk, right? So <laughs> I'm setting up the PA system for the Call of the Wild, and it's very serious, and there's people running over me like, Dylan, there's people inside the park right now. Um, something, <laughs> something's going on. So I'm like torn, like, oh my god, call the wild, call the wild. <laughs> <laughs> and because, like, you see Dennis, who's actually in the back there, he's got an armband on, right? We basically had a police marshal liaison system, and um, <clears throat> at this point, I've got to hit with, like, a wave of responsibility, where I feel like, oh my god, if the cops come into this park, and they arrest a whole bunch of people, you know, I'm going to feel responsible for this, i got to bust them, or... I'm going to walk slowly <laughs> over there and then see what the situation is like. Um, so we get inside the park, and uh, it's basically, I've never seen so many people smiling, people were crying, um, people were just kind of overwhelmed with emotion, and it was one of these great instances. Like, most demonstrations, or larger demonstrations, or even kind of smaller actions, people can kind of sometimes feel that people power, right? That kind of invincibility of the fact that, like, we've got a bunch of people here, like, we can't be messed with. We're going to actually exercise our rights. Uh, in this case, it was like times 10. Like everyone was just really into what was going on. Um, and because of our history with the cops in 2011, they actually only had two officers there at the time. So it was like 
they weren't going to do anything. Mm -hmm. um, people get inside the park, they chant, they go down around the Dolphin uh, Auditorium, chanting, shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. And finally, about 30 more police officers come in, they fly inside the parking lot, and they what they do is they split the auditorium side, those people go around the other side, and the people on this side come back around. They make the trespass to property request, so um, trespass to property act is probably like the most important thing to know as a as an activist or an organizer. Basically, uh, until an occupant or a representative, which can be a police officer or a security guard, makes the trespass request, you're not actually trespassing. So if Guelph University doesn't want me talking here tonight, that's their problem until they come and say, Dylan Powell, you're trespassing with Guelph, you know, Guelph property. So because the trespass request isn't actually made before people enter the park or while people are entering the park, the cops show up in force and then start basically making the trespass um, to property request at that point, saying, you know, everyone has about five minutes to go inside this park or we're going to start ticketing people for trespass. Yep. That, does that apply to all situations and all property? So um, you have to read the Trespass to Property Act because it's like it, it's different for farm situations, for okay. you know residential areas with lawns or without. Um, but basically, like as a baseline, I don't want anyone to get a trespass ticket. It's about sixty five dollars. It's very much like a traffic ticket. Right. Um, but in those instances, like a lot of people think, well, if I'm just on the property of someone who I don't like or I'm opposed to, therefore I'm trespassing. If they have signage up that says no trespassing. Um, it becomes a little bit of a different story, but if there's no signage up, there's no request made by an occupant, you're not actually trespassing at that time, right? That would be like, you know, I would just sit on my porch and like wait for you to like walk by my house and run out and be like, <laughs> citizens arrest, you're trespassing, I'm Gary McHale. <laughs> Although technically, Dylan, if we were in there, without really like paying to get inside, that was also... One of the awesome. gates was wide open, so yeah. that's my response to that. Um, and that was funny, and a lot of people on Sun Media and comments afterwards were like, oh, they all paid to go to the park, that's so stupid. It's like, do you really think people like orderly lined up? I was like, yes, I'm going to go shut the dolphin show down, here's your $50. Thank you, shut it down. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> so the, the police basically cattle people, they move people around, and we see that right off the bat, their strategy is to go after um, smaller female demonstrators who are either carrying bullhorns or have their faces covered, or are like chanting loudly. Um, that was basically their strategy. They tried to go after one of the organizers, Jenny, who's uh, right here. And then uh, Chantel Godin is another girl. Um, she is the only person of all of the people who were inside the park and the whole history of our campaign, she's the only person she got a trespass ticket. That's why we have this image that's like, ah. That, that over 30 demonstrations, thousands of demonstrators, constant police presence. And when I mean that, I like legitimately mean that constant police presence uh, and one trespass ticket. We set up a candlelit vigil in November and we found out the cops had like a full staked out perimeter of like five to six cops so that like 25 of us could hold candles. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, and then there's a the great quote. We're going to put this on a t-shirt sometime. A violent and illegal campaign of intimidation and harassment. That's in my statement of claim, Lars and Ringland. One trespass to get $1.5 million in response. Um, so basically what ends up happening is those people go to the other side of the auditorium and we're stuck on the other side of the fence and the whole time I'm wondering, like, I'm feeling sick again because I feel responsible for the people on the other side of the auditorium. And my worry is that they're going to get kettled there and those people are going to basically be the ones who are going to get charged for what happened. So I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I'm refusing to basically leave which like effective activism 101, if you're an organizer, you know, at the end of the day, you have to feel a sense of responsibility or you're not a good organizer. Um, you know, I've been at demonstrations where people have kind of led people into the fire and then just kind of walk away. And uh, if you do that, people will remember that. Don't ever do that. Um, so I stayed there. Cops are still kind of threatening at the time. They're kind of, they're threatening me that uh, they're going to charge me with inciting a riot. Um, so it was like, okay, I don't care, whatever. Um, I just need these people to get out of the park like, without being charged, right? Finally, after a couple minutes, I hear there's like the little crusade. There's like 50 people left, and they're all chanting, still walking around the megaphone. Shut it down, shut it down, shut it down. They had like gotten lost. They didn't know how to get out of the park. That's why it took so long. So they come outside, and we basically walk out to um, Spandy Andy, who was a performer at Marineland. 
um, for a long time, but he had left. Um, he gave a, one of the best speeches of the whole day, basically saying, like, I understand now, and when I left, that, you know, as a human performer, I consented to my performances. You know, the animals on site here, they don't consent. Like, they're starved so that they actually perform these tricks, right? That's how the process works. And he was like, I can't, I can never go back to a captive animal park and do this, but we come out and he's doing Gangnam style to like a crowd of like hundreds of people who basically taken over the parking lot this time. And uh, I haven't touched very much on coalition organizing, but everything that basically happened after that August point was only made possible by the fact that previous to this, a lot of people who were involved in organizing with Matt were organizing in different movements and in different communities as well. And we were pulling on resources and pulling on people who weren't really in the animal liberation movement, but who were people who were sympathetic and people that we'd organized and helped out in other kind of instances. So when I say things like, you know, 800 people, that's the second largest animal advocacy demonstration in, uh, you know, in, in Canadian history, and the, the largest one in like 28 years, you know, how would we have the resources ourselves or the know-how to really manage those numbers? So we basically lean on and pull on people who we're organizing with, um, doing Haudenosaunee solidarity with, people who are doing anti-nuclear organizing that we organize with, people who are doing migrant justice advocacy work and um, um, immigrant, immigrant advocacy work, and bring them basically all in uh, to help us work on our, our bus strategies, work on our press strategies, work on developing our, our videos that are leading into our demonstrations to do our design work, right? And the beauty of Spandy Andy and Gangnam Style is one of my really good friends, Zach, who is primarily an anti-nuke organizer who's really got involved and helped out with us. Um, he's one of these people who like documents, you know, every like moment of his life, right? Like everyone has a friend like that at this point, right? Um, and his whole thing is like, you know, if we do, he, he wants everyone to like pick up on something that's kind of viral at the time and bring it into what's happening. So he gets off the Toronto bus that day and he's just like, comes right to me, Dylan, Gangnam Style. Today's Gangnam Style Day. I'm just like, at that point I, hadn't even, I didn't even know what the heck Gangnam Style was, right? <laughs> but he's, he try, he's trying like all morning to get people to do Gangnam Style and everyone's like kind of shy and nervous. But then it's like Spandy Andy doing Gang and Style after everyone's in the park and everyone's just losing their mind. It's like everyone's doing Gang and Style. And uh, he got his video because it, it did go viral. But so um, that demonstration basically ends that day. Uh, one person, as I said, got a trespass ticket. Uh, all the images from inside the park go viral. Um, it's, we get news media internationally. It's another huge push basically to our campaign. We get a whole bunch of support that comes out through that. Um, and it was an amazing day. Uh, we move on from that, we do things like a candlelit vigil that tied in the veterinarian Marine Land Jude Murgel because she has a duty to report. They'll tell you over there, the CBO, um, that if you're, a, if you're a practicing veterinarian, you have to, to report abuse and neglect. Um, Did the police ever give an explanation as to why they singled out one individual for a ticket? If you, you can see the video of Chantel's... Um, they did handcuff her, but Chantel's trespass ticket. What ends up happening is she's trying to go back up over the fence to go back into the park, and she has a female cop who doesn't uh, doesn't identify herself, um, grab her right arm and pull her down. Chantel turns around, not understanding like who has just done this to me, right. um, and is visibly like very upset, like "fuck you, what are you doing?" Um, then a male cop comes around behind her, shoves her in a in her right shoulder. And she basically tries to break his arm, like knock his arm down. Um, and as this is being filmed, he then sees that the whole thing is being filmed. He leans into the cop and says, you know, basically, you know, you're being filmed um, to the other female cop. They cuff her, take her out to the car, let her go to the demonstration, give her a trespass ticket. So um, their explanation is that uh, she was trespassing. She was never, there was no trespass request ever made to her. No cop ever identified her, themselves to her or made any asks of her in that instance, right? And all of the moves that were taken by the cops, you know, if a cop is to use force against you, they're supposed to be using it in a way to demobilize you, right? Like that's a kind of a barroom thing to go up and just push someone in the shoulder. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really do anything. But you can see the whole video of that. Um, and we have a statement of support that we put up for Chantal too. So we... What's that? Uh, she didn't, but you can. And I really suggest that in every instance. Um, because trespass tickets are very much kind of like traffic tickets, 
you have the same thing which happens with traffic tickets, which, what is that? Cops have to show up. Yeah, <laughs> cops have to show. <laughs> so it's uh, cost no money really to fight tickets, and um, it's like an eight month process. So if like you get a trespass ticket like tonight and you fight it, you're not going to go to court until like you know November December. Uh, cop probably won't show, and then a lot of instances, especially at demonstrations when cops are issuing trespass tickets, what they're actually trying to do is shut the demonstration down. They don't think that the ticket would actually hold up in court. But they just want to remove you from the from the situation at that point. So, yeah, fight trespass tickets, like in public nuisance tickets. If you ever get busted for sidewalk chalking and they ticket you three hundred sixty five dollars for public nuisance, fight it. Personal experience. <laughs> <laughs> for sidewalk chalking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Rick Dykstra's office. Stop the deportations. Three hundred sixty five dollars later. Um, that's a side story though. <laughs> <laughs> So this basically happens, uh, we continue on with demonstrations after October the 7th, and we're trying to kind of keep momentum up. We do the candlelit vigil, we bring in June Mergle, and then in December, finally a story that we really pushed, um, the Toronto Star Investigative Series on their site officially starts in August 15th, 2012, but they were actually starting the series in 2011. Um, and that started with SeaWorld bringing their Orca, orca uh, Kaika back from Greenland because in court documents, they say that Marineland doesn't have the facilities to psychologically or physically care for marine mammals, which is like, that's, that never happens. No, like, no marine park or captive animal park goes out to another one. It's like, you suck, you know? Um, <laughs> that happens, trial star comes down, they begin the investigative report, and right off the bat, this is like our main focus. The fact that all the animals that die there get buried on site. Because the imagery that, that creates, right, this is supposed to be a family fun park. It's like... When you think of dead animals being all around, it's not really as fun as it once was. So finally, if you want to chart, like, you know, how long sometimes press stories happen, this is like June 2011, December 20th, 2012. The story finally gets released on the fact that Marineland has been burying animals on site for 50 years with no permits and no oversight. And they have four pits, and the largest pit has over a thousand animals in it. And it's right beside the Welland River. Um, the Ministry of the Environment triggers an investigation, and there's kind of huge uproar. And Marineland at this point has no way to deal with it. So what happens on December 21st? I'm at the I don't know more march in Ottawa. I'm freezing cold because just like today, I don't know how to dress appropriately, and there's slush everywhere. So I sit in like a cafe. A Sun Media reporter calls me and says, Dylan, you're being sued for $1.5 million. So in a lot of ways, slap suits will basically shade a press strategy with a legal strategy. So they have this statement of claim basically on the shelf, written with whatever they could write about me, right? Dylan Powell's, uh, Dylan Powell's vegan, and uh, uh, <laughs> this one time he said that like property destruction's okay, and uh, people enter the park. And uh, he's mean. And there were strollers. There were strollers in the South Park. It's just like, okay, whatever. It ended up being about 40 pages. And in my original statement of claim, about 90% of it has absolutely nothing to do with me. Um, but that became their press strategy. They had no way to effectively respond to the fact that they had all these animals um, dead on site, right? Um, Anne Marie Rondinelli does their press. She actually had like the, one of my favorite quotes of all time. And it was... Um, <laughs> Sometimes at the end of an animal's life, they die. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, so they had no way to effectively deal with it. So basically they pull this suit off the shelf. They throw it to local sun media. Local sun media runs it. And the story is no longer about, hey, Marineland has all these dead animals. It becomes about, hey, Marineland's suing you know, Dylan Powell. And we're sun media, so we hate Dylan Powell. Um, we've hated him for a long time. He hates us. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a vegan. Yeah, 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 and that too. He Keep that. His nuts on yeah, yeah. Don't forget that. He's ridiculous. <laughs> so basically, in between the span of time, and this is what uh, I want to kind of uh, really focus on. I don't know how much time I got left here. I just start talking, and then it's. You have plenty of time left. Yeah. Plenty of time. Okay. Um, so basically, what happens in a slap suit, if anyone here is ever kind of in that kind of territory, there's two ways to effectively, in my mind, fight a slap suit. One of them is you have to counter sue and win, um, which is tough because that takes a lot of resources. 
um, over and above just fighting the original suit, you have to counter sue and win. If you can do that, you can illustrate back to whatever corporation that's going up against you that there was no reason for them to ever attempt that strategy again. Or you use the slap suit basically to broaden your reach and to broaden your organizing base, to bring in new people, and to basically get out front of the issue. The same way that cops come to our demonstration in 2011 and try to intimidate and harass us, and we spin it back and build, it's the exact same thing that we're trying to do with the slap suit. So since December, this is probably like the fifth or sixth um, speaking event, specifically for the legal fundraiser. Uh, because we knew Marineland was litigious, which means they sue people a lot, uh, we've been organizing this for this from the beginning. We knew if we were going to be successful that they would sue us. Um, so we've been able to try and neutralize this with the least amount of resources that we possibly can, because slap suits can get really expensive. And uh, the demonstrations haven't stopped. So much in the same way that they, you know, leased up the property we're used to demonstrate on, we're still demonstrating. We did a demonstration on site. We've moved to Niagara Falls City Hall to call them out for all the BS that happens on the municipal level. And we're still organizing in the same way that I talked about October 7th as that kind of moment, um, you know, that's in the future. Our opening day demonstration is May 18th. And we're hoping to, again, put kind of record-breaking numbers up there. Yep. Uh, right on the, if you see like the, the tattered yes. mad bucket, yeah, <laughs> we call him Coiny 2012. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, that's where we get kind of right up to today. Um, and basically what you've got is a story of, you know, calling bluffs, of continually escalating and spinning things back. Um, it's important to do your own media to film, to prep, protect each other, and stand up for each other when things happen, yep. So should you win the countersuit? Where does that money go? I, I haven't countersued yet. Um, and it will be up in the air whether or not I countersue in my case. Um, if I countersue and I win, uh, I'll give a bunch of money to Green Oaks Trailer Park, uh, the Niagara Animal Defense League will get a bunch of money, same with Greenland Animal Defense, and probably a whole bunch of other really cool things that I'd like to do, but that's like, you know, what are the chances of that ever happening? Like uh, to effectively counter sue. Um, one of the reasons why it's not a strategy that I'm all not all that interested in right now is like that takes years, like years and years and years. I basically have to commit like years of my life to trying to fight in the courts to counter sue. And um, I think that we have a shorter timeline that we can actually effectively close Marine Land um, before that. <coughs> Hopefully, fingers crossed. But you guys have a community here. Um, this is a funny story. I um, in Niagara, I'm known as like the guy who like really gets in people's faces when they want to leave. Um, because what happens is um, it's basically a university town at this point, and there's a huge brain drain. Like a lot of organizers who come to Niagara come for a little while, then they leave. Uh, we never see them again. And uh, that's one of the reasons why actually the animal liberation community is as big in Niagara as it is compared to other social justice communities where like nothing is going on. And that's just because people in that community stayed, um, other people didn't. So I like to say blood in, blood out. Um, people join, then they can never leave. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, I almost got a job at CFRU here. And um, that was like the last time I was like ever legitimately thinking about like, I'm gonna leave Niagara. And um, I've always had like this kind of feeling about Guelph. Like, if I ever left Niagara, I think I'd leave in a body bag. But um, Guelph is a great town. It's a very progressive town. Um, I was asking people earlier, like, what are some campaigns that are still going on? And someone said Wellington Water. I remember getting a Wellington Water leaflet like five years ago. Um, so that's that's big. Like, there's campaigns here that are already existing that you can get in on that have that kind of institutional memory that are multi generational. Or, you know, people in the community you can also learn from. Um, there's someone recording this talk that knows a lot about police repression and organizing. Um, so hit up Mandy at Oak Creek Guelph, right? Um, and uh, Guelph Pig Save. I know that there's a Pig Save group going on here locally. Um, there's people doing, you know, uh, student activism on campus. These are all things to get involved with. And basically the story that you got today is like a group of young kids who didn't know any better you know, started something and basically just committed to it and we're dedicated to it until the park closes. 
and uh, hopefully we'll reach that goal. And look at all the success we had over the span of two years. It took a lot of luck, I'm not going to lie. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, a lot of that was hard work and dedication. And it's, it's not as if any of us are quote unquote professionals or any of us had um, you know, amazing skill sets or anything like that. You basically learn through trial and error. And it's just something that can be duplicated in a lot of instances. Yeah. There's a big AR community, like Facebook and Twitter and that, and like in the Golden Horseshoe. Mm. For opening, for the opening day, if, if <coughs> there's any way of organizing transportation, uh, we could really rally a lot of people, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you the quick rundown on bus strategies. Um, my organizational history with buses, I hate buses. Because everyone says they're going to get on a bus and then no one does. Mm-hmm. Um, in the October 7th demonstration, we had over 100 people um, um, confirmed for buses, and I think we ended up having something like 45 on. Uh, we took a huge loss, over $1,000 on buses. Uh, we're moving towards a system of a pay up front system for buses, mm-hmm. which, if anyone here, if you don't have union money, um, being perfectly honest, don't organize buses um, on your own because you don't have the resources to pay those bills if people don't show. So move to an upfront system. Uh, $10 upfront secures your space. Uh, make sure you know you have 48 seats on a bus. That's $480. You know, don't try to trigger a bus from Kingston, which is going to be like $1,200 on $480, and then you have to come up with the rest. But uh, we are working on a bus system for the larger demonstrations. So for May 18th, there will be buses going, um, or at least we will have a registration system in place. And if enough people register and pay up front, then we will trigger buses. Okay. Um, I'll go through some of the photos, and then we'll do some Q&A. This is some of the artwork on the sign I was telling folks about. Those are the Keep Moving guys. That's back when we used to hand out leaflets. The good thing about this photo, that's Alex, who uh, actually got John to not kill us that day. Um, <laughs> We had a pro-worker stance from the get-go. Um, it was really important for us to have a critique of capitalism and to understand who were actually, actually the decision makers, right? And a lot of organizing in the animal lib community, um, unfortunately, a lot of focus is on workers. Um, people celebrate, you know, undocumented migrant workers being charged for animal cruelty as a, some kind of victory. Meanwhile, the, you know, the factory farm and everyone who profits off it in the actual structure just goes untouched. And they're more than happy to offer up you know, workers like that. So it was really, really important for us from the get-go to have a pro-worker stance and to basically, you know, make that known to the other people who work there. This is a, a facility where you have a lot of, um, you know, minimum wage jobs, no pension, no job security. They're hiring from high schools and they're hiring people who are already semi-retired. Um, so there isn't like a whole lot of job loyalty either. So a lot of people that, you know, uh, Bill is a supervisor on the right. I know all about his daughter and the university she's in and we're great pals. Uh, you know, Alex, I know about his history. He ended up going and doing framing houses up north after he quit Marineland. Um, stay in touch with these people. It's more than the fact that, you know, they're human beings and they deserve your respect. But, like, when you're organizing in a space like this and you realize you're going to be there consistently, right? If you're doing, uh, well, pig safe stuff, Toronto pig safe is good with this. Like, understand that the people who are working in these places, you work at a slaughterhouse, you don't, no one gets up in the morning and is like, I want to work in a slaughterhouse. <laughs> you know, I want to work in Greenland. Yeah. No one does that. So, just be mindful of the fact that, you know, capitalism creates these kind of scenarios where we're forced to compromise our ethics and do things that we don't want to do. And, you know, I, if I want to, you know, shut down Greenland, what decisions can Bill make to do that? <laughs> or can Alex make, right? It's John Fuller that controls the situation, so... That was the day that I stood by the truck and I got mad. Looks like I'm wearing jail, jail shoes. Uh, we, tra- we did that image for Christmas. We were trying to... Cool. <laughs> uh, there's me with uh, one of the sergeants dealing with the sign thing. This is with, like a, one of the things we would do to kind of escalate. We would like set up and we would put our ladder there. Be like, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Ladder's out. Um... Demo poster from October 7th. That was from outside of uh, John's home. This is like, the, you want to talk about like intersectional and like um, coalition building like mottos to put on banners. Like you can take that pretty much anywhere. <clears throat> um, for May 18th, uh, if people watch some of our demonstration videos, we have a young activist. His name is VJ. He's probably about seven or eight. And uh, he's been like obsessively folding origami whales. Uh, because Japanese folklore, if you fold a thousand origami whales, you'll be granted a wish. 
his wish is to basically free the animals at Marine Land. So for May 18th, awesome. we're trying to honor him, get everyone to fold an origami whale, bring it to the demonstration. And uh, the Guinness Book of World Records is actually like, you know, 1500. So we're hoping to break the record and then honor him with having it registered in his name. So uh, one thing I will say about that, there's a lot of people and a lot of adults and a lot of people who get caught in kind of this game of like, you know, oh, it's going to be this that shuts Marine Land. I'm going to be the one that shuts down Marine Land. You know, I did this, I did this. Anyone in this room thinks that anyone over the age of 12 is going to shut down Marine Land. They're an idiot. Uh, it's kids who go to the park. It's kids who keep that park open. It will be kids and the change that comes from those kids that's going to close that park. No one else. Um, and we've been really lucky over the span of when this, this off season, uh, every week we have kids basically giving presentations to their entire schools. We have schools dropping off of, uh, dropping Marineland off of the list of places that they're visiting. And that's all student led. So these kids are involved with the demonstrations and uh, up on what we're doing and they want to get involved. So you know, they're taking the initiative. And that's what's going to basically, you know, in my mind, be kind of the change and the change maker in the situation. It's sometimes really, really like hard in kind of more radical organizing to bring in kids, make a space for kids. But if you don't, you will end up with the exact same problems that were happening previously where there's just generational gaps, right? Um, if we have a base of kids now who are 12, 10 years, you know, they come up, they have the whole history of this organization, and then they can move into places where they can organize. You know, I don't have to do this until I'm 50, you know, or 60. So that's for people who are in for the long-term haul. Uh, Rick O'Berry right there. Famous Dolphin Liberator. Uh, that was one of, I have like, I have a wall of yellow envelopes from Marineland. Uh, this actually sits up, this is a plaque that's on the Niagara Falls uh, Humane Society wall. So a lot of people, when this happened, they were like, oh, well, the OSPCA will solve this issue. Um, John Holler actually donated the building and owns the land where the Niagara Falls Humane Society is on. And uh, everyone who was working in animal supervision of the park who came forward, uh, came forward detailing that they would get calls days and weeks ahead of inspections. Basically, they would be tipped off um, for the longest time. That's a seal of approval. <laughs> uh, this was a... That was a cease and desist. That was the first one we got. That was in 2011. They were trying to claim uh, trademark infringement. Um, another thing which I can say, if people like, this will really only affect a very few amount of people in this room and maybe no one anyway in the future, but if you are doing campaigns like this and you get a cease and desist, um, make sure that the first one you reply to, you get legal advice for and you make it really, really like professionally sounding. Because um, what they're attempting to do is they're fishing to see what kind of legal resources you have. And if you respond with like, you know, on a paper napkin, like <laughs> rainbow color, yeah, yeah. Then they'll be like, oh, nice, they have no lawyers. They're gonna get fucked. Um, so make sure for the very first one, be like stern, like, you know, this is all the reasons, uh, legal language, um, you're an idiot. Um, but for other cease and desist, like there's really no, unless you're gonna actually honor the requests that are being made, which most cease and desist in these cases are just outlandish, like, uh, we got a pile of cease and desist and we're just like, will you agree to never hold a demonstration again? It's just like, why would we ever do this? <laughs> so in a lot of those instances, if they're asking outlandish things, don't start the dialogue and don't worry about bringing lawyers in because it's just going to cost you time and money. Yep. Have you seen the decrease in people coming to the park since you Yeah. Yeah. So we had a lot of turnaways, especially when you put like 800 people out front of the park. We had more people out front of the park that day than entered. And when people see that, they think, oh my God, what's going on? They come and get information and they leave. Um, and uh, even in numbers at the end of the season from like, I've been outside that park since like 2008 and looking at their parking lot, it's still a big parking lot and there's a lot of people still going, but um, there was a decrease. Uh, we will never be able to get gate numbers from them unless someone leaked them. But uh, what we also ran up against was the fact that if you go to Marine Land, it's $50. If you buy a season's pass, it's 55 so a lot of families who were going, right, um, were, have already paid for this. A lot of them are kind of low income, same with fixed, fixed kind of income. They have this pass, and they read all the stories, and like, you know, we hate this place. 
well, we can't afford to take our kids somewhere else and get a season pass somewhere else. So they would go in and, uh, you know, ride the rides. They wouldn't take their kids to go see the deer or the bear, bears because they felt that that was really sad. Um, and that's one of the main things that we're basically waiting to see this year. Like, how many of those people renew their season's passes? Uh, right now, we know already because a whole bunch of businesses have been contacting us um, and forwarding us what Marine Lance Marketing Department has been doing. They've been like working the phones really hard and contacting businesses that they have no relationships with, being like, we'll offer you the greatest corporate package. Um, so we know they're in a state of like serious desperation because a lot of schools are dropping, a lot of businesses are dropping, um, and they've got kind of a real problem on their hands. Um, yeah. Regarding the gates, uh, couldn't you dedicate someone with a counter just to sit and watch cars and take shifts or whatever? And if that information is valuable. Yeah, the only problem with that is it's a very long day. Like, um, their gates open at uh, around 9 and uh, don't close until like dusk. So, right. like, we could do that on a certain weekends and that may be something we move towards. Um, but in the end, there's a lot of other ways to kind of get a better sense of their desperation. Like, their suit against me was an act of desperation. Um, them reaching out to people who they have no no contact with businesses is an act of desperation. The other suits that they've filed, same thing, right? Um, yep. Um, have you considered trying to find someone to offer your job there? I was just going to ask Just to like, get some footage of these? That's there's, like, there's nothing that I could say right now that would like honor that thing because it's everything's being recorded. But, um, <laughs> Uh, one th no, no, no. One thing I can say about that is um, this is something that people came forward with a lot after August 15th. And the response that I have to that is that uh, whistleblower testimony is so much more powerful than if we send someone in and they get a job. Because you're getting like years and years. Between like those 15 people, if you actually put the amount of years together that they've worked there, it's like hundreds of years, you know? There's nothing that we're going to see that's going to be new, really, outside of that. Like, there may be a, a good amount of information still continuing to come from the park, but it's another reason why it's so important to have a pro-worker, you know, strategy in place, because in the AR world, you know, I go to get a job at a pig slaughterhouse, I film footage, I come out, I release it, people are shocked by it, but then the industry comes back and says, look, this person had a clear motive going in. Um, they clearly like edited it in a way and put it in a context that is sympathetic to their cause, but you know this isn't factual, right? Um, that's the only thing I can say. I can just imagine what their screening process is right now for hiring new people. <laughs> Are you like? Have you ever eaten tofu? <laughs> <laughs> that was our first leaflet. Uh, design of all time. We say that like these leaflets cost Marineland eight thousand dollars a year because that's how much their lease is uh, of that property. So yeah. Oh, that was the very first uh, mad demonstration right there in two thousand eleven, and that's people are standing there on the property that's leased now. This was people inside the park. The image went viral. Um, that was the dolphin show that got shut down up there. Sweet demo shot, help you see. This is like a, this is one thing I want to bring this up because uh, there needs to be more dialogue about this in communities. If people want to wear bandanas. That has nothing to do with a reflection of you or the demonstration or anyone else. This is a perfect example that I can give of this. Jenny actually has asthma, debilitating asthma. She wears a bandana because she's out in the elements, right? Um, and a lot of people see this and go, oh my god, I'm like, too far, too far. It's people with bandanas. Um, you know, all of the people who are involved in organizing and uh, the cops who are on the ground, they know names, they know faces. You know, they know people's body types and sizes. There's nothing that's being hidden here. So, you know, if other people want to wear bandanas and things like that, that needs to be like a dialogue that kind of stops in communities where people are kind of ripping on other people for however they want to act. 
That was, this is fingers right here. Being like, holy shit, holy shit, John, what's going on? <laughs> that was people as they just kind of hopped over into the park. As you can see, I'm nowhere around. Uh, another, that's the Sarge. Sarge and I are like BFFs. Another one, sidewalk chalk. Sidewalk chalk, I got really, unless your town has a bylaw against it, just use it in every instance. Didn't uh, McKay just come here? Yeah, yeah sidewalk chalk the town. McKay's a goof. Um, so there are more photos. That's VJ right there. And there's some of his whales in the background. Standing in. <laughs> This, uh, what, what uh, Rick is holding up here is in the 90s, he actually tried to lead a, a push to get this uh, Dolphin Duke out of Marineland. He was being kept, and this is like a captive animal park kind of secret. Um, there are a lot of animals that end up in captive animal parks that just resist. They, they resist to the point where they just refuse to be trained and refuse to perform. Um, or they're too ugly, or they get too ugly. So what happens to them? Um, in Duke's case, he was left in a barn in a tiny tank that barely, like, he could barely turn around in and left there to die. So um, in the 90s, Rick led this movement to try and get him out of the park. Basically, you know, John Holder, you're never going to use this animal to perform ever again. Why not just give Duke to us so that we can rehabilitate him and either keep him in a sea pen or release him if he can be released? And uh, John was like, no, I'll let him die. And uh, that's what ended up happening with Duke. There we are, back at that. Any questions? Other than the ones I've ever been asked. Are any of the police officers friendly? Uh, I have met a million vegan cops in my life, but I don't think any of them are vegan. It's just like, you need to understand uh, policing and policing strategies, especially when they're working with demonstrations, so you'll get good cops and you'll get bad cops. Um, I don't really have any comment on like who they are or how they are as individuals because I'm sure they're different um, from when they're doing their job, but you have to basically understand the role that they're playing in policing, right? It's not as if, you know, they care about the demonstration or care about you. They're there to basically perform their job, right? Yep. Did they, in the lawsuit, did they blame you for like organizing the people to go into it? Yep, so... <laughs> This is, a, this is a really great thing about understanding why people need to have media literacy. Um, the week after October 7th, lo local Sun Media papers, which the people understand when I say Sun Media, who that is. Yeah, yeah so right-wing right corporate media, basically. Um, Quebecer Media Incorporated owns Sun Media, but it's the same kind of conglomerate. So Toronto Sun, um, and then all of basically the Niagara region is basically controlled by Sun Media. So the Niagara Falls Review, the St. Catharines Standard, the Falls Review, uh, the Welland Tribune are all owned by some media and they basically dominate that market. So the week after the demonstration, there's like three straight in different papers, um, editorials on Marine Land Animal Defense, most of them center on me and they smear me. I'm called an anarchist, a call leader, a uh, terrorist. Um, and then in the one op-ed, they say that I orchestrated people going into the park. And the journalist who actually wrote that, his name is John Law, he wasn't at the demonstration. And there were two Niagara Falls Review reporters, the same publication, um, who worked the demonstration, who knows, like, who know that that is just absurd. Like, all the demonstration footage shows that. There was no one who was like, yeah, yeah, come on. Look. Or like, no flag went up in the air, or like a bird call was given. There was nothing. Like, it was just a spontaneous kind of action by people who felt this kind of power by organizing together. But he writes that, uh, that op-ed, and um, Sun Media basically refuses to pull it down because I don't really have the resources to, you know, sue Sun Media. It stays up. And when Marineland files their statement of claim in December, they basically use his op-ed as a legal justification for them making that statement. So they say, oh yeah, Dylan orchestrated people going into the park. And you respond with, well, 
What makes you believe that? Well, John Law wrote this opinion editorial. Where does John Law get his information from? <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's so important in these cases, you know, to understand, uh, be have some media literacy and understand how like press strategy and legal strategy will kind of shade each other. This has happened consistently. Um, you know, Sun Media had my statement of claim 14 days before I had it and before any other news source had it. So how could we respond? Right? So, so uh, they actually, has that they use the word terrorist? Because that's defamation. I'm not like, that's a, the, they understand the fact that if they want to write whatever they want to write, that there's really nothing I'm going to do about it. Like, at the end of the day, the people who read some media and read it in that kind of light and take it in those literal terms aren't really our base. They're not really people we're going to reach. And, um, you know, I don't really care. I haven't called a terrorist since like 2008, so it's whatever. Hmm. That, that bothers me because that's. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And of course, this isn't evil, so whatever. It is what it is. I don't know. I, I, maybe Nick Wright should. I don't know. It's not panel justice. I, I mean, obviously, it's your call. It just it seems to me to be yeah. unacceptable. I think it's more important for people to. You know, when you respond in that way, you're giving power to the people who are using the terms and you're, you know, treating it as if, you know, those kind of things are just like the, the words themselves aren't really an illustration of the power they're trying to use. Like, someone who's an oppositional figure to me wants to call me a terrorist, like, it really means nothing to me at the end of the day. Like, um, and for me to get upset about that or to fight that would be giving those people way too much power. Like. People want you to take focus, they use rhetoric like that to get you to take focus away from the issue you're actually like being successful on. Like, it's one of the hardest things of organizing is that, you know, you basically have to constantly battle yourself um, to not basically move to something else or to, to get in a battle with some media or to, you know, fight. Like, um, one of the great things that happened after December 21st was I had like, Dozens of Facebook accounts that were had like started nine minutes before friend me on Facebook and a whole bunch of Twitter accounts that were just dedicated to like blasting out smears against me. Now, was this coordinated? Who was behind it? I, I'll never know. I have some IP matches, whatever, right? But I could literally have spent like days just responding to these things that people were posting. And what does that do? The whole intent is like if we move Dylan away from what they're actually organizing, what they're doing, then we can be effective. It's like just let people say whatever they want. I really don't care, you know? Um, at the end of the day, the people who I organize with are the people that I'm accountable to. My community are the people that I'm accountable to. And uh, the people who know me are basically my friends and family you know, are the people that I'm accountable to. The rest of the world, whatever. It is what it is, right? Yep. I, I guess I've come along the same line. I think that, like, within movements, often we experience, like, um, I guess an escalation of response, and and at that peak, you know, you get you get uh, like a slap on the other side, either in like um, like a slap lawsuit or with legal charges or whatever it is. And what happens then is that there's like a, a period, sometimes a really long period, where people then aren't really organizing, and it like it literally does stop the movement a lot of ways. And people's energy, like you just said, are focused on like supporting the people who are who took this on for us kind of thing, right? Yeah. So I feel like in some ways that you have avoided this in some in some capacities and, mm -hmm. and like I think that you spoke to like, you know, you took the tactic of using the using it to broaden the reach and things like that. I think that like some other folks have done that also. But I think that like and if you could speak to that a little bit about mm -hmm. focusing on like using those opportunities because if it's if it's there, we often aren't using those opportunities because we get really freaked out. Yeah. And then often our all that work and that escalation just goes downhill again. Yeah. There was a huge case in the United States, um, the Shack Seven, and um, the reason why that case was so important was that the United States government um, and industry understood what that case meant. So leading into the anti-HLS campaigns, you have like 15 years of campaign organizing in the UK, which is consistently winning, consistently shutting down um, cat breeding farms, consistently shutting down um, uh, veal transportation, 
Um, moving on to you know, uh, Huntington Life Sciences, which is a vivisection contractor firm. And those models all consistently build, and it's the same model. Like, if we can effectively shut down marine land, you know, we can pretty much effectively shut down any captive animal park, you know, in southern Ontario, beyond, type thing. And we can use this campaign as a model to continue to organize against other kind of issues and other kind of places. And it just builds momentum. So, in the Shack 7 case, you have this, like, 15 years of momentum where people are feeling like, you know, we're going to win at the grassroots level. Like we're going to win. And the multinational kind of advocacy upper crust was really threatened by this because they're still getting a ton of money and a ton of resources, but they don't have the same effect because there's all these people on the ground who are mobilizing around this issue. Um, Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty was the name of um, basically that, that organizing kind of group. And um, they get so far as they actually are able to get Huntington Life Sciences delisted from the New York Stock Exchange. They cost that company millions of dollars. Like they were having successes that were like mind blowing, like blowing the minds of other people who were organizing in other movements for a very long time, and it felt like they hit a roadblock. Um, so the Shack Seven case comes down. Six of the organizers, there were seven, and then the, the one of the individuals was dropped. Six individuals basically go off on charges, um, conspiracy charges, and kind of a various array of things. Uh, people who were kind of key organizers. And the effect that that has, um, they fought it for a while and they ended up losing. The effect that it had on the animal liberation movement as a whole, campaigning is weird now. Like, it's 2013 and it's weird for people. Like, people think that, like, consumer veganism and, you know, uh, just promoting veganism on the street or leafleting or doing educational things are the way that we're going to win. Meanwhile, if you actually understand the history of like how this movement has been built and the successes and what has actually built those organizations, it's happened through investigations, large-scale investigations, large-scale campaigns. And it's also happened like through the legal system from ways like this, right? So, you know, it's really, I don't want to, you know, uh, really get people to think like, oh, don't do this or don't work with these groups or all these things, but like, of all the things, I like know the history of the movement right off the bat because there's been so many examples of people who have turned cases like this into something as a positive. And um, I helped run an animal liberation and earth liberation front um, archive for a very long time. I read everything in it, every single thing. The model for the Niagara Animal Defense League and for Marine Land Animal Defense actually comes from Cascadia Forest Alliance, which is a West Coast kind of earth liberation. They've been working on trying to save old growth forests for a very long time very successful model. We basically just took that and incorporated it, right? Um, and the history is all there as well for like understanding, you know, how the legal system has basically cut us where we go back through that cycle where we have to re kind of invigorate and start the movement all over again, get people back interested in like actually campaigning. Veganism is great. It's an extremely important tool of, you know, animal liberation as a movement, but it doesn't actually do anything for living animals, animals that are actually existing on this planet. It reduces the demand for animal products, but you know what are we going to do with all the animals that are performing circuses, all the animals that are being tested on, animals that are currently within the you know, agricultural system? Um, you know, do we just kind of sacrifice them? Um, that's another thing too, is like really refocusing what like veganism is. It's not just about like the products that you buy. Um, something much more important than that. Yeah. I wonder if you can comment on a, a bit of a concern that I have. I. I I see it in the states, and I forget the name of the act, but there's an act in the U.S. where if you're if you bring into a, a factory farm or slaughterhouse, you can be uh, tried as a terrorist. Yeah. Literally, yeah. we don't have that in Canada yet. But I'm nervous with our conservative government mm -hmm. that they may say we better get something like this in place too, mm -hmm. so that we can shut people up in Canada as well. Just before Sorry. I answer that, I want to plug one, two things actually. Um, so tomorrow night, Josh Harper is actually going to be speaking in Buffalo at Burning Books, which is uh, Leslie Pickering's uh, bookstore. And uh, that's at 7 p.m. And Josh was a part of that Shack 7 case, and he also worked on the archive with me. Um, there's no one in the animal liberation movement who has more stories or more knowledge of that history than Josh. Um, so I'd really, people can like last minute, 24 hours, like, I'm going to completely change my plans. I would really head down there tomorrow, do that talk, or go to Kitchener and Waterloo. Maximum tolerated doses being screened at Kitchener and Waterloo, I think University of Waterloo tomorrow night. And that is the greatest resource in film that they see details workers who have come out and given testimony about the vivisection industry, um, which is animal testing, if you don't know what vivisection is. But 
What you're speaking to specifically is ag gag bills. Yeah. And basically, um, they're designer legislation. So in the United States, you have ALEC, which is basically a industry lobby group that has consolidated lobbyists. And, um, you know, the vivisection industry and the animal agriculture industry will basically design these bills with the knowledge of the fact that people are trying to get access to the workplaces to document these things. They'll write the bills, and then they'll send them out to every single state, and they'll try and pass them in every single state legislature, and they'll try and do it continuously. So if the bill fails five times, they'll put it up a sixth time, seventh time, eighth time. And the goal is if you pass it in enough states, then you can make a federal legislation. And there's a precedent for this. When the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, the predecessor was called the Animal Enterprise Protection Act, but the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act comes out, you have groups like Mercy for Animals in the United States where we're still doing open raids prior to that, which an open raid is basically um, you're transparent in broad daylight. You know, you walk into a barn, you rescue a bunch of chickens, um, you place them in a in a sanctuary, and you're you're open about the whole process. You don't cover your face. You know, you publicize the whole thing, and it's a whole open process. They were doing that before the AATA came down. AATA came down, they stopped doing it. They start focusing on undercover investigations. That organization builds substantially over the last two years based solely upon investigations. Uh, this is a really important tactic. But they're hoping that they can pass in enough uh, state legislatures to have the same kind of response, basically push people out of you know, using it as a tactic. Only thing I will say in response is, um, you know, if vegan bake sales are outlawed, then outlaws will hold vegan bake sales. Um, <laughs> Yeah. There's in every social justice movement there is a history of escalation on both sides. You have escalation of repression and you have a response back. So, you know, that's just kind of it is what it is. Um, I think that industry is kind of overshooting their goals and thinking that, you know, in the same way that John Holder thought he was gonna lease a part of land and we were gonna go away, like even if ag egg bills become federal legislation, it's gonna do absolutely nothing to stop the stream of people publicizing animal suffering. I'm just curious what you think the progress of the from the SVP without the character of John Holder kind of involved. Uh, just because I feel like there's always a lot of um, like, <coughs> sort of like unease at um, people challenging institutions when it's like you know university here or um, when the OSTA steps in, people like, or some media or stuff like that. People are really uh, tentative to kind of um, attack them, whereas a person could be much more easily turned to a villain. Yeah. So, like, yep. how do you encourage No, people? John, um, uh, as a character, is something that we has always been kind of used there and has always been effective. That was something we knew from the get-go, and, uh, you know, we filmed all our interactions with John. We made John a central figure because he's a central decision-maker. So, you know, you have to really convert those strategies of, like, yeah, we want to create kind of our side narratives that bring people in and kind of focus attention, but it has to also be someone who can actually, you know, change or has some kind of control over the issue. Um, John plays a huge role, especially in 2011, of like growing this campaign. Um, a lot of what Marineland has done has been like the greatest things that could ever possibly do for this campaign and for us. And that's when I say like luck, right? Like um, they have lawyers, they have social media strategists, they have people working with them basically saying like this is what you need to do and they basically just consistently refuse to take that advice <laughs> and do things which are helping them. <laughs> Anything else? I feel like this question period should go on forever. <laughs> any, uh, I don't know if the reporting matters, any are you against the idea of civil disobedience? No, no. And uh, I've been perfectly upfront and transparent with that uh, throughout. Um, a lot of people wanted us to denounce people going to the park. We refused to do so. We offered a statement in support of um, you know people, the Chantel who got the ticket and supported the tactic. Um, I would like to know for people who feel like it went too far, like a history of a social justice movement where people have not committed civil disobedience. And um, I'm also on record um, it's in the statement of claim, and I've stood by this forever. I support property destruction. Um, I don't see, you know, property destruction as violent. I see the system of property as inherently violent, um, and I don't see how inanimate objects, you know, can feel pain. Um, 
And especially in this case, you know, I'm not advocating or encouraging property destruction on marine land, but that would be the caveat. But um, as far as if we're talking philosophically, like what tactics do I or do not do I or do do I not support? You know, I, I wholeheartedly support civil disobedience. Um, and this wasn't the first instance either of civil disobedience, either with this campaign or um, the history of organizing in Marine Land. There was in 1996, six people got arrested, um, including, uh, I'm forgetting his name now, but the guy who organizes the shark showing animals, uh, respect and kindness. Um, they tried to do a lockdown and a banner drop, and um, you know, people got arrested. We just did a demonstration at Niagara Falls City Hall uh, a couple weeks ago, and there was uh, one young person there who showed up, and um, they were throwing snowballs at the wall. And this was like, you know, all the media who covered this, and for some reason, media were just like all over the story, but all the local media who covered it focused on the snowballs. This kid throw, threw probably like six snowballs at a brick wall for the matter of like a minute. And like, this was too far. <laughs> you know, this was too far. Like, and to me, I, I'm, I'm losing my patience for even, uh, you know, having the discussion because like, I think back to, you know, Brian and Connie's struggles or I think back to, you know, Teresa like losing her aunt. Like 47 families get evicted and no one says a peep, no one says anything. Someone throws a snowball on a wall and it's like, you know, but that's, you have to really organize with that in mind, right? Anything that you do as a kind of a step back. We live in a society where we don't have a really uh, protest culture or a protest history, and um, the scope of tactics that are generally acceptable with the wider public are extremely ineffective. You know, all these people who are mad about snowballs want us to sign a petition. There's a petition on this issue that had over 80,000 signatures, and it's completely pointless. So a, a petition for what, sorry? Uh, regulation and reform of marine land. There was a petition put forward by Phil Demers and Zuchak Canada. Oh, okay. And um, it was an online petition, which if people, you know, there are times where petitions can be very useful. Don't, like, I support a diversity of tactics. Sometimes petitions can be really useful. Um, online petitions, not so much, because if you're sending to elected official, they have to see that, you know, that's actually going to have an effect. It's going to translate into votes. If you send Dalton McGinney an online petition and... 70,000 of the signatures out of 80,000 are from outside of Canada. Yeah. Why does he care, right? Same, similar situation locally. So petitions are better when they're at their municipal level and they're targeted at specific people and you can illustrate the fact that everyone who's signing this petition could potentially vote for you mm -hmm. and this issue could potentially reflect back on you. But yeah, snowballs and home demos and everything, like we, we know that we're going to be kicking, fighting people, like kicking and screaming through this issue until we close apart. But hopefully the goal is, is that we make people aware that like this history exists, that these campaigns have existed, that they've been successful, and you know, that these tactics are effective, even if they make people feel uncomfortable, but we'll eventually reach the goal that we want, right? And in the process, we won't harm anyone. <coughs> People are starting to bail, so I don't know if like had your attention for a real long time. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, I really appreciate it, and everyone was a really captive audience. Sweet, so thank you.